Hello, and welcome back to the Thinking Progressive Weekly Progress Report. I'm your host, Ron Rivers. It is Friday, October 18th, 2019. And in this week's episode, we're going to discuss Senator Ron Wyden's Mind Your Business Act, Facebook's new propaganda policy, and new science and technology news that you should know about. You'll note that I'm avoiding the impeachment inquiry, and that's for good reason. There are plenty of sources of information out there about impeachment, and when I created this podcast, I wanted to make sure that we were offering something unique, deep dives into subjects from multiple perspectives. The objective is to better understand our progressive movement as a whole, and in that process, better understand ourselves. The impeachment process, while long overdue, is going to be all that we hear about over the next handful of months from the majority of news outlets. I hope you'll consider thinking progressive as a brain break from the noise. I want to begin this episode with recognition of the passing of Eli Cummings and appreciation for his service. Uh, Congressman Cummings served 12 full terms representing Maryland's 7th Congressional District and first took over the office after winning a special election in 1996. He also served as the chair of the House Oversight Committee. And in a long era of political cowardice, Congressman Cummings has consistently been on the right side of history. In some of his final moments, he spent his time signing subpoenas from his hospital bed. So thank you, Congressman, so much for your service. Your memory, I'm sure, will live on. Yesterday, Senator Ron Wyden proposed a Senate bill that would give the Federal Trade Commission more power to crack down on tech companies found responsible for enabling privacy violations. And it threatens up to 20 years of jail time for tech executives who mislead the public about these violations. The Mind Your Own Business Act would enact harsher penalties for privacy violations than those currently in place. You probably remember Facebook's Cambridge Analytica privacy scandal, which helped propel Donald Trump to his presidential victory. It was investigated by the FTC, and the settlement included a $5 billion fine. And while that was the largest FTC fine in history, Facebook made $56 billion in revenue last year alone. Um, Facebook's stock price actually jumped after the fine was announced. Now, according to CNN, the bill would propose the following. Tech executives who lied to the Federal Trade Commission about misusing Americans' personal information could face up to 20 years in prison. Tech companies found responsible for privacy violations could be fined a special tax penalty proportional to their executives' salary. And the FTC would have to have the power to fine companies up to 4% of annual revenues for privacy violations. Tech companies would also be required to provide users a one-click solution to opt out of companies using their personal information to sell targeted ads. And tech companies would also have to provide free, quote-unquote, privacy-friendly versions of their products for low-income Americans. Consumer advocacy groups would have the right to sue companies for privacy violations. So in what seems to be a positive progressive trend, political leadership is waking up to the fact that billionaires, especially tech billionaires, have too much power and influence within society. The prison time is an interesting deterrent, although I'm one I'm not wholly convinced can be realized even if the bill passes. Uh, between the packing of courts with partisan conservatives and the United States history of oligarchs, it's unlikely Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos uh, would ever face jail time with the present leadership in power. One-click opt-out is a nice idea. I think targeted ads are more likely to entice people to buy given that they're based off of behavior data mining. And it'll be interesting to see how Facebook will compensate as we can imagine that advertising revenues would decrease. Speaking from the perspective of someone who has a long history of experience advertising on Facebook, their targeting is their value. So without that hyper-targeting, uh, I'm not sure that I would personally invest uh, with any of the companies I would work for in Facebook advertising. The advanced fines are also a good idea, but, but overall I feel like the bill falls short. On the surface, it's exciting. It's going after the wallets of big tech companies and, and threatening to put the executives who misbehave in jail. But an economic punishment that is essentially a redistributive effort is unlikely to be enough to make these big tech firms change their behavior. It's also a reactive bill, a trend we desperately need to get away from here in America. It's reactive because it punishes companies like Facebook after the damage is done. In 2016, we saw exactly what kind of damage can occur 
and no amount of fines is going to stop companies from pursuing these revenue streams. There is just too much profit to be made and the fines will just be considered a cost of doing business. Again, we know that Facebook was fined $5 billion on a revenue of 56 billion. Um, so obviously not that big of a, a hit. But even worse, the consequences of these companies abusing our data extend beyond just capital. Um, under Mark Zuckerberg's leadership, Facebook has played a direct role in dividing and polarizing our population. Elizabeth Warren's plan to break up big tech companies and Bernie Sanders' new plan to democratize the market economy. Now, in episode four, we discussed why Elizabeth Warren's plan to break up big tech companies is, is not the ideal solution. It projects a mode of regulation developed to take down large infrastructure companies such as telephone, rail, and energy uh, onto big tech. But big tech companies don't suffer from the same physical restrictions as those companies in the past did. So breaking up their platform into separate entities isn't going to be as effective as we'd like to imagine it would be. Uh, because their primary products are virtual and it's well within the power of Facebook, Google, or Amazon to skirt the laws by recoding offending aspects of their platforms. It's well-intentioned, but it's unlikely to be more than a moral victory. If you're interested in a more in-depth argument about why breaking up big tech won't work, check out the source links below. Uh, I've linked the Thinking Progressive podcast episode number four, uh, where I argue it in depth. Now, Bernie Sanders' recent plan talks about democratizing the economy, essentially ensuring that companies over a certain size have a high degree of social responsibility. He would accomplish this by mandating that all public corporations earning over $100 million have 20% of their company controlled by their workers, who would also have the right to elect 45% of the board of directors. Now, Bernie's plan is a big step in a new imagination of economic arrangements, um, and one that cannot come soon enough. When companies reach a certain level of integration within society, they should become public assets. I'll support that argument by saying that companies today are reaching monopoly status in their specific niche faster than ever before. And more importantly, once they obtain monopoly status, their ability to hold onto it is much stronger than companies have ever had in the past. And that's because the way work is done in these knowledge economy companies is that creativity, innovation, and autonomy are all part of their core business operations. Combined with a deeper suite of social protections to raise the floor for every person in a more competitive middle, socializing our highest performers is an excellent way to prevent the financialization models that so often take the place of innovation in maturing technology companies. So what do I mean by financialization models? Well, essentially, when a company reaches a certain threshold, uh, for example, we can talk about Uber. Uh, it's a very recent one. Um, Uber is looking for any way possible to make money at this point. They've been hemorrhaging money for quite some time. Um, their business model isn't working despite having market monopoly uh, or close to it. And so what they're going to do is, is stop investing in technological innovations and start investing in the commoditization of the platform. How can we extract wealth at every turn? Now, this is by nature typically a death spiral for technology companies. Once you stop innovating, you leave your core business model behind, which in, in technology is innovation, uh, and that stagnates the company. By ensuring a high degree of social ownership in our most advanced monopolized companies, we ensure that A, the benefits of those companies tend to benefit society and not just the shareholders, but B, that the collective populace has a say in the direction of those companies of how they will continue to grow and impact society as a whole. Now, speaking of big tech, Mark Zuckerberg spoke at a Georgetown University uh, seminar yesterday about Facebook's decision not to regulate political ads. Notable quotes from his speech were, as a principle in democracy, I believe people should decide what's credible, not tech companies. And we don't fact check political ads. We don't do this to help politicians, but because we think people should be able to say for themselves what politicians are saying. He continued, for the same reason, if content is newsworthy, we also won't take it down, even if it is otherwise would conflict with some of our standards. Now the speech comes after Zuckerberg met with Republican lawmakers to discuss ads on the platform. 
He also discussed how Facebook would stay out of the Chinese market to continue to promote the values of free speech. Now, on one hand, we can observe this strategy as one that could save Facebook a lot of headaches. By denying any form of responsibility to moderate uh, as a policy, Facebook essentially is saying, look, I own the pipes, but I can't control what goes through them, uh, and I'm not going to control that. Now, the problem, of course, is that we already know what type of influence Facebook can have on people. It's dramatic. As if polarization wasn't a big enough problem, from September 25th to October 1st, the Trump campaign spent over $1.6 million on Facebook ads, many of which included false or misleading claims. So the ads are spreading lies, but are allowed to be hyper-targeted to the people who will believe them because free speech? And this is where it gets sticky. But it's a moment in time that every progressive should remember. At the end of the day, Mark Zuckerberg has made it clear that Facebook's bottom line is more important than the sanctity of American democracy. It's easy to say that we want Americans to decide. It's a quick punchline that appeals to American autonomy, to freedom. But Facebook is directly responsible for the shifting of political norms and blurring of reality for so many Americans. So in essence, Facebook under Mark Zuckerberg's leadership has caused political polarization for profits, but now wants no responsibility in cleaning it up. It's a cop-out, and it's betraying the future of our generation. The same people who see and believe Trump's ads are electing representatives who deny that climate change exists, who want to persecute individuals based on their skin color and religious identities, and who time and time again write policies to transfer wealth from the poor middle class Americans to the most wealthy elites in this country. Facebook is complicit in the decay of American society and progressives should make note to remember Mark Zuckerberg's choice in the coming decades. Now moving on to technology news, the discovery of a new universe of mini proteins is upending cell biology and genetics. Biologist Eric Olson of the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas has discovered that a small protein called myoregulin has tremendous impact on muscle function in mice, and it's opening up a new universe of exploration in biology. Early findings suggest that microproteins bolster the immune system, control destruction of faulty RNA molecules, protect bacteria from heat and cold, dictate when plants flower, and provide the toxic punch or uh, the toxicity, the, the deadliness of many venoms. And while the smaller proteins lack the ability to fold, limiting the complexity of their functions, their size gives them the unique ability to kind of fit into nooks and crannies of larger proteins that function as channels and receptors. So the, the technology and the exploration of this new discovery is, is still in its infancy, but cancer researchers are trying to capitalize on a microprotein in the poison of the death stalker scorpion of Africa and the Middle East. The molecule has a mysterious attraction to tumors. By fusing it to a fluorescent dye, scientists hope to illuminate the borders of brain tumors so that surgeons can safely cut out the cancerous tissue. It lights up the tumor and you can see the margins where there were metastases, uh, King says. A clinical trial is now evaluating whether the dual molecule can help surgeons remove brain tumors in children. Genetics and genetic engineering is going to be a part of humanity in the very near future. And as progressives, we should be thinking about, discussing, and debating what this means for society. As we continue to understand more about the human body, so will we unlock the potential for radically reshaping what it means to be human. But how are these benefits going to be distributed? Which countries will have access to them? And how are we going to decide what is and is not acceptable? Now, let's not forget that China has already altered the genetics of an embryo to avoid HIV and, by what I am sure is total coincidence, happens to improve intelligence. Pulling a personal anecdote, I know a couple who recently had a genetic test done when they learned they were pregnant, allowing them to have a full scope of potential issues that could happen to the baby based on their personal information. And I mean, this is just the beginning. Genetic engineering is likely going to be a tremendous scientific vertical in the future. In America, it's likely to face political resistance from our more fervent religious believers. 
But this technology, like any other technology, is going to disseminate rapidly once it hits a price point available to the masses. And why wouldn't we? If babies can be born into this world free of genetic disease, who's to argue against that? It can also help humanity with one of the biggest banes of our existence, slow and painful deaths. Almost everyone hopes that when death comes, however it does come, that it'll be quick. But today, it's just simply not the case for so much of humanity. Genetic engineering promises the possibility of dying without prolonged suffering, and that we could cure most of the degenerative diseases so that when death would come, it would be from something like a heart attack or a brain aneurysm or something that would happen uh, from age. But where do we draw the line? And are we destined to create a race of superhumans? Is this going to be a eugenics war as foretold in Star Trek? You know, it's, it's still too early to tell now, but it's not too late to begin the philosophical discussions about how we want to manage this technology. It will transform us. I have no doubt about that. But the question remains in what direction and for what purpose? Let me know what you think about genetic engineering and the future of humanity in the comments section below. Well, that about wraps up this week's progress report. But before I go, I want to just take a moment to ask you to subscribe to our podcast and YouTube channels. It's a simple click. It requires about three seconds worth of your effort and would really go a long way in helping to share ways of thinking progressive with more people. If you can spare the three seconds, I would really appreciate it. Thanks again for tuning in to this Thinking Progressive podcast. Once again, I'm your host, Ron Rivers, and I look forward to next week's discussion.